Let's receive our daily bread right now. Father, in Jesus' name, we believe we receive the living word of God, our daily bread from heaven, the incorruptible seed of the word of God. And we thank you, Father, that you give us exactly what you want us to hear and be nourished and grow up on in Jesus' name. Now let's acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is Lord over my family, in my family, over my life. Jesus is Lord over my nation, and Jesus is Lord over the nations of the world. Jesus is Lord of all. And at, at the name of Jesus, every knee bows right now, and every tongue confesses that he is Lord in heaven, in earth, and under the earth. Today, I have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. Today, the eyes of my understanding are enlightened by the Holy Spirit. Today, the Lord is my helper. Today is my day of salvation, and now is my appointed time of God's profuse favors his rich blessings on me, favor upon favor, blessing upon blessing, grace upon grace, and gift heaped upon gift to me and my family now in Jesus' name. And Christ is made unto me wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Praise God. Praise God for his word. Praise God for his word. So, going to the parable of the sower, this is soil, type 3. And so, in Matthew 13, 22, he says, He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful, or he becometh unfruitful. In Mark chapter 4, verse 18, And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word. Notice that in all three types of soil, the person is hearing the word. And this is, this is really what God is saying to you as a person to not have the first type, not have the second type, not have the third type, but have the fourth type of soil in your heart. So he's not talking about four different people. Uh, I mean, he could be, but as far as the way the Holy Spirit is ministering this to us right now, is he is telling us to have the fourth type of soil, but to make sure that our soil is not wayside soil, our soil is not stony ground soil. Our soil is not full of thorns, but it is good soil. So, let me read that in the Amplified in Mark chapter 4, verse 8. And the ones sown among the thorns are other who hear the word. And again, I started to say this, but every one of these, one of the things that is the same is they hear the word. But with three types of the soil, the word is totally unproductive. Well, we're talking about the incorruptible seed of the word of God that lives and abides forever and is designed to produce a crop, a harvest of what it says. For instance, if it says, if the word says, by his stripes you are healed, that word is the incorruptible seed that is designed to produce healing in your body. If the word is, but my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus, then that word is designed to produce exactly that. If the word is, my peace I give unto you, then that word of peace is designed to produce in your heart the very peace of God. So like God said in Genesis 1, that 
he um, called forth every herb bearing tree whose seed was in itself. So the incorruptible seed of the word is every promise, every word of God that is designed to produce in your heart. So with that thought in mind, let me read this again out of the Amplified. And the ones sown among the thorns are other who hear the word. Then the cares and anxieties of the world and distractions of the age. And my, my, I believe that was for today. Talk about distractions on every side, social media. Um, you know, when the Lord spoke this, they didn't have TV. They didn't have the Facebook, they didn't have the social media. I don't, I'm not even sure what all the social media is right now, but they didn't have all of that. And yet, he said, the anxieties of the world and the distractions of the age and the pleasure and delight and false glamour and deceitfulness of riches and the craving and passionate desire for other things creep in, where does it creep into? Into the heart and choke and suffocate the word and then the word becomes fruitless. So what we're going to do is we're going to pull out the thorns out of our heart. Any thorns right now, uh, he gave us three. That is um, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word. So we are focusing on, again today, the deceitfulness of riches. And like I shared yesterday, that part of that is, and I'm, I'm sure there's much more to it, but the part that I know is that the thought that, you know, if I just had a million dollars, my problems would be solved. Well, no, they wouldn't because you could spend the million dollars probably in a couple of weeks' time. Or if I just had all the money in the world. Well, no, because you could have all the money in the world and be miserable. Many, many people are there. They don't know the Lord. They don't have the joy of the Lord. Whereas when God gives you something, he gives it to you to richly enjoy. And it is a tree of life to you. And that's the heart of the Father for you, is to bless you. Let me read this. Um, I read it to you yesterday, but I want to read this to you again in uh, Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. This talks about a person that covets money and errs from the faith and pierces himself through with many sorrows. Then he said in verse 17, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. So here he's saying, don't do this but do this. And you you don't even have to be rich in this world's good to do this. Because if you're like me, you started out with n practically nothing. I remember Frank and I, when uh, the Lord sent us from Maryland to, as the Lord spoke audibly to Frank and said, to work the work that I will show you and send him to Birmingham. And we were... Uh, living with his parents at the time in a small two-bedroom house, and we had nothing. What little furniture had, we had was in Maryland, and we didn't even have the money to be able to transport it down here. It was getting to be summertime, and I thought, you know, we've got to be in a house before school starts. We've got to be settled. And so Frank and I had learned a little bit about faith and began to believe God. Uh, but 
the Lord spoke to us, Psalms 115, where he says, And the Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. You are blessed of the Lord, which made heaven and earth. And Frank and I looked at each other when that word was quickened to us. And we said, even a dollar would be an increase. I'm telling you, we had nothing. And so we believed God to be able for him to have a job. That was a miracle in itself. Well, I'll just share some of this with you. Um, so he applied for a job driving a truck and he went to this company and they said, well, we're not hiring. And, but he had believed God for the job, a job there. And so he just said, well, you'll need me. And he went over and sat down and just waited. And within a short amount of time, they called him to the desk and said, we just got this huge order and uh, we need you to take a driving test. And they hired him that day on the spot. That was faith. That was Frank believing God. And so then uh, we believed God for a house to rent. And we didn't even know what side of town to go on. And we just trusted the Lord to give us the, the side wherever he wanted us to go. And we would think about one area and it was like, no, don't go there. And we, so we ended up in Forestdale, which we didn't even know existed. And God provided us. We, so Frank planted a seed uh, of money. I think he sent it to Oral Roberts. We had learned somewhat about seed time and harvest. And he put an ad in the paper for a house to rent. And his father, I think he was ready for us to move out. He said, son, don't be so specific. But we got a call. God provided that house. It was perfect. We had asked God for a house that had a boy climbing tree, the number of bedrooms, a study for Frank, and that it would be close enough for the boys to walk to school uh, because we only had one vehicle at the time. And it was exactly what we had asked for. It was just perfect, a perfect place for us to rent while we were believing God for our own house. But, and it had the boy climbing tree in the, in the front. It had um, the study, the number of bedrooms, a very nice house. But um, God, and God provided the money for that. And then we believed God to be able to get our furniture, what little bit we had from Maryland. And there wasn't enough left over in the, um, from his salary, but we just believed God for it. And do you know, God supplied the money for him to go up and bring the furniture back. I'm telling you, saints, when you believe God, he, he wants to increase you and do you so far greater than you can do for yourself. Well, I think I got a little sidetracked, but um, anyway, so he said in, then in 1 Timothy 6, 17, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, Notice that word, uncertain riches. Uncertain. Why? Because, you know, with the banking system and, and with people, I know I've heard of people that have lost their 401ks because companies squandered it away. That's uncertain riches. But you know, God's kingdom is sure. And hopefully we'll get into that. But he said, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. And this has been the day and age where thieves have broken through and st stolen people's retirements. But, he said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves cannot break through and steal. Satan can't even steal your money. And it's laid up for you to be able to draw it out whenever you desire to. So, he said, um, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things 
to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, that mean, means ready to give, willing to communicate, that also has to do with giving money, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. And then um, in the Amplified, as for the rich in this world, charge them not to be proud and arrogant and contemptuous of others, not to set their hope on uncertain riches, but on God who richly and ceaselessly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And then he says, charge them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be liberal and generous of heart, ready to share with others in this way laying up for themselves the riches that endure forever as a good foundation for the future so that they may grasp that which is life indeed and jesus said this in john 6 27 labor not for the meat that perishes but for that meat which endures unto everlasting life which the son of man shall give unto you for him hath god the Father sealed. So, I know that you've all heard this story, but, I mean, it's a true story. It's, it's in uh, the book of Mark. But let's read this again and just see this for what it says. This is the rich young ruler, which you've all heard about, but listen to it as if you've never heard it before, because there's a lot more to this than what we've heard. In uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 17, And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why do you call me good? There is none good but one, that is God. And we should say the same thing. There is none good but is God. Now, he has made us righteous, and he has made us, uh, has purified our hearts and sanctified our hearts. But notice the humility of Jesus. He says, you know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor your father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing you lack. Now listen to the whole thing because this has been, um, this particular scripture has been abused. Okay. One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. And, listen to this, come, take up your cross, and follow me. So the take up the cross and follow me were instructions for him. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. So this was a very rich young man. And when Jesus told him what to do, what he was doing was dealing with a heart issue. He was not dealing with his money. He was dealing with a heart issue. And Jesus answered, notice Jesus did not chase him down either. He didn't say, oh, wait, 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 you need to understand. No, he let him go. And Jesus looked round about and said unto his disciples, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words, astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said unto them, children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches, there's, there's the heart, 
trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, said, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Now listen to this. Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels. But he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. And so what he's talking about is like someone that has to travel to to leave their family to go minister. Frank had to do that a few times. Uh, I know of other traveling ministers that they have to leave their, their family at home and then come back. But he's saying that they shall receive an hundredfold now in this time. And, and whatever you give up for the gospel's sake. So Peter said, Lord, we have left all and followed you. What was all that Peter left? Listen to this. In Luke chapter 5, verse uh, 4 through 11. Now, when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon. So Simon Peter had, Simon at the time, he had loaned Jesus his boat. And you know, when you give to God, God is not uh, someone that begs or borrows. So Jesus, right after that, right after he used his boat, he said, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. This is what God has in mind. Anytime you sow into the kingdom, he gives you a boat sinking load of money or whatever it is. But, you know, we have to let down our net of confession and receive what he has promised us. But continuing with the story, he said, And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes that they had taken. And so, let's see. And as was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth you shall catch men. And when they had brought their, their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. So they had just received the largest catch they had ever had. Their boats were sinking with the number of fish. They had just received the hundredfold or more, I guess, on Peter, Simon at the time, sewing his boat to Jesus. And now, look what he did. They forsook all. They left that. They left the fish, which I'm sure uh, Zebedee or 
whoever was with them, whoever was over them, took those fish and sold them. But as for Peter and the other two, they left it all. They walked away from it and they followed Jesus. Now let's go back to the rich young ruler. Jesus told him, go sell all that you have and give to the poor. Do you know what the promises for giving to the poor is? One is that you will never lack. One is that uh, in Psalms 41, there are several promises attached to he that gives to the poor. He said that he will never lack, that he, uh, God will turn all of his bed in sickness, that he will be blessed in his land, and that he will not turn him over to the will of his enemies, and that he will um, uh, turn his bed on languishing, I believe it it is, which I'm not exactly sure what that is. But there are, there are many, many, many uh, promises attached to giving to the poor. So this rich young ruler, had he known that, had he believed that, he probably knew it, but had he believed it, then he would have been so eager to go sell what he had and listen and take up his cross and follow Jesus and walk in the power of God and receive from the Father and, and have the miracles, the signs, wonders, and miracles. He walked away from all of that because of the deceitfulness of riches. Because here he had the riches on one hand. Jesus was saying, sell it and come follow me and you'll have treasure in heaven. Jesus was offering him to live out of the kingdom. He missed his hundredfold. He missed more than that. He missed trusting in and believing God. He missed living by faith. He, he missed out on so much because of the deceitfulness of riches. So don't get caught up in that. And you know, even as you begin to increase, don't transfer your trust to the wealth that is there. Remember that he that gave it to you will give you more, but keep your mind and your thoughts on the word of God. The word is our source. God is our source. I'm looking for a scripture. Yes, Jesus said to the disciples because he commanded them when they, he commanded them to go out. He said, don't take scrip or bread or money uh, in their purse. He said, just take a staff only. And then later he said, when I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, did you lack anything? And they said nothing. God wants to bless every person so far beyond what you can ask or think. But there's the world's way, there's the mammon, and then there's the kingdom way. So we don't want to get caught up in the deceitfulness of riches, of money, of putting our trust in what we see, but learning to trust in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. So allow this word to minister to you and to make some decisions about it. Lord, show me any area that I am trusting in money, any area that I am trusting in anything besides you, uh, whether it's little or whether it's much. I remember when the Lord spoke to Frank to cut up our credit cards and, you know, at that time, we had a Sears Roebuck credit card, and he, would, he did it in fear and trembling. It was like, where am I going to get new tires from? Where am I going to get a new battery from? But, you know, we learned to cut the world's way off and to believe God and never looked back, never regretted it. Always so grateful for everything that God has done for us. And we're on the increase. Remember all day, Jesus is Lord. Thank God for his word. And thank God this word is becoming flesh in us right now in Jesus' name. Get rid of the thorns.